when they're on. Part two. So we'll start where we left off yesterday with potentials, uh, equilibrium potential for an ion is called the Nernst potential, the reversal potential. We saw the Nernst equation briefly. And the membrane potential is a weighted average, and we're about to show that. It's weighted by conductance. Uh, resting membrane potential will be steady state, where voltage represented, the change in voltage with time represented by all of these things here. Um, are, uh, people are going to be contributing cats during my talk. OK, fine, fine. Um, <laughs> That's great. Uh, anyway, are all zero. <clears throat> so dv dt, b dot, v prime, all meaning the same thing. Partial of v with respect to t, that's the Greek deltas. And delta v over delta t means the numeric solution, which we'll see in a little bit. So the resting membrane potential, how do we calculate it? Well, we use the parallel conductance equation, also known as a Goldman equation, which is actually different from the Goldman Hodgkin Katz equation, which if we end up having enough time, we'll get to at the end. Um, so the reason everything is at rest is that because the conductances, which are functions of voltage and time, uh, do not move if the voltage does not move. So they are stationary, they're stable. So those rheostats, the ones with the lines through them, the resistor with the lines through them, GK, GNA, are constant at constant voltage. So we can simply say that we now know from what we looked at before, that CV dot, actually should be negative CV dot, um, is equal to a GN, a GNA times V minus DNA plus GK, et cetera. So uh, let me switch this. This thing seems to have gone off. So then, is that still terrible? Adequately? Maybe not. Well, slack me if you can't hear me. I don't hear anybody responding to me. We can hear. Okay. Thank you. Um, so at uh, V dot equals zero, no change in voltage with time, we're going to have uh, a zero for the left hand side, no change. If there's no change, then there's no flow through the capacitor. Uh, again, keep in mind. This is already, uh, this equivalent circuit model is a conceptual model of a conceptual model. So, uh, you know, to the extent that there is no charge movement, this, this will be true. Um, and then we can simply do algebra and we set it up, as you see, to that uh, value at the end where the voltage, the resting membrane potential voltage, is the weighted sum of the ENA, EK, and E leak in the case of Hodgkin Huxley, uh, where the weighting is the conductance at rest, which is the G called G bar with a line over the G of the individual ion types, the individual pores. Uh, and then we normalize it effectively by uh, GNA plus GK plus G leak on the bottom. So, again, any questions, please ask. That's just algebra there. So now we're going to drop ourselves back and just deal with the passive case. So upper left here, we have the active case, and I just whited out the stuff that was active, the rheostats, the two rheostats here, and all I'm left with is the leak conductance and the leak battery. And again, a conceptual model of a conceptual model, I just whited out again the pores, except for this one, which we'll call the leak pore. And the leak pore is going to be no, that's wrong. Yes. Okay. The leak pore is going to be <clears throat> primarily uh, co uh, conducting. Let me just turn something off here. That will help me, I think. Uh, primarily conducting potassium. So its E leak, its reversal potential, will be something like negative 70, negative 80. It will not be as low as EK, which might be negative 90, because there is some passage of ions in the other direction, probably sodium as well. In fact, there's certainly, again, the conceptual model, there's a concept of a single E-leak. There's certainly not a single E-leak. There's a number of channels that contribute to E-leak. So, 
What does the passive membrane do? It shows exponential EXP, short for exponential. That's the little EXP is what you would use in a programming language like Python, exponential charging. So we have the equation. If we put in current in, I in equals V over R. So that's V equals I R. That again is Ohm's law plus C dV dt. That's the law of capacitance. <clears throat> and then we can uh, set it up as a differential equation um, and solve for V. And uh, if you look at my textbook, we have that how that solution works. But uh, here's the answer. The answer is uh, voltage equals IR times this charging curve of one minus e to the negative t over rc. So you can see that that solution is going to look like this curve we have here, because as t, when t is zero, anything to the zero is one, one minus one is zero, you start at zero. When t goes towards infinity, e to the negative big, big, big number is going to be approaching zero. So it's approaching zero and you get the ir. So the v max, the maximal conductance, is going to be IR, Ohm's law. And that R, in that case, would be called the input resistance. And that's something that we do frequently measure, the experimentalists rather frequently measure in cells, and we frequently measure in our models to see that we are comparable to them. Again, this will all be off depending on how many active channels might still be, be there. So in a real cell, you cannot get rid of all the active channels. You kind of try to do so by blockers, pharmacological blockers of potassium channels, pharmacological blockers of sodium channels, et cetera, to get rid of any active process. Um, and uh, typically what you do is you would do this in a negative direction going down from re resting membrane potential. Here is just a Example numerically where we start at zero, but actually we would be starting at negative 65, negative 70 at the resting membrane potential. You go down in order to avoid activating sodium channels, which are highly nonlinear, show a great deal of positive feedback, as we'll get to when we talk about Hodgkin Huxley. So the input resistance is one critical factor, and the other is the time constant tau which is given by RC. So RC here is in the denominator. So when T is equal to tau, T over to tau is uh, one and E to the negative one, that turns out to be 0 0.37 approximately. And uh, that means that once you reach this time constant, you'll be up to approximately two thirds. And again, you know, if you're doing math or engineering here, if you're doing, if you're, if you're doing spaceship design, you would never say approximately two thirds for a 0 0.63, but biology is sloppier. So we often will say, okay, that's two thirds. Uh, of course, when we write a paper, we'll put the proper number in, but for the purposes of just going through it and understanding what's going on, that's two thirds. Um, <clears throat> So the capacitance is what limits the speed at which the membrane potential charges. Uh, and one thing you can do with neuron is to show that by simply removing the capacitance, set capacitance to zero, and suddenly you just get a ramp of uh, uh, instantaneous change, uh, or, and you can change resistance to zero, sorry, and that gives you more of the ramp. So that's uh, worth playing with to see what that looks like. So what do we do on the computer to solve this? Well. Generally speaking, computers don't do calculus, so they don't do a solution such as we just showed. Now, Mathematica, Maple, Wolfram Alpha, I'm sure MATLAB now, they can all do this. They can solve ordinary differential equations. It used to be that you had to go to a fat book of ODEs, ordinary differential equations, to get these solutions uh, or else figure them out yourself. <clears throat> but nowadays, of course, the computer can do that. But if you gave it this differential equation, the computer would not do that because it takes the computer longer to do this symbolic calculation and solve the ODE than it takes it to do what's called a numerical integration. And so that's what the computer does. Now, in the case of even just the hodgkin huxley equations, which is four-dimensional, or very much more so in the case of many coupled hodgkin huxley equations, uh, with, uh, let's say, many of these, up to 20 of these channels in a compartment, uh, you would not be able to 
you could not possibly solve the linked ODEs using any kind of uh, precise uh, definition. That's why the physicists and mathematicians go to great lengths to do simplifications, dimensional reductions. Uh, the book to look at for that, I think, is the uh, Izakevich textbook, where he really goes through how you can reduce these and understand them in two dimensions and see the Hopf bifurcations and the Hodgkin-Huxley equations and other equations. Uh, we tend to not do that because these abstractions represent another another kind of conceptual model, a platonic model, a mathematical model that's really, to my mind, very abstracted from reality. So we want to work with all of the linked ODEs, or as many as we can, because if we really tried to do even as much as we know, which is a tip of the iceberg, we wouldn't be able to run them even on our HPCs, high-performance computing machines. So linked to ODEs is one of the big problems, if you will, of handling the uh, com computation of computing a neuron. The other one is, uh, or one of the other ones anyway, a uh, major one is synaptic events or other events. If you start a current clamp, the beginning of that current clamp is an event to the uh, system. And of course, this makes you have, it means you have highly discontinuous systems. And a highly discontinuous system is not one that's going to be differentiable in all derivatives. Uh, first derivative, second derivative, third derivative is not going to be easy to get it to go. So uh, it's not going to be possible to solve it. We do a numerical integration. What does that mean? Well, we take the same differential equation, which was dv dt, and instead of an infinitesimal, which was the dt, we now have capital delta, capital delta, distinguished from the small delta, which was partial derivative. Capital delta is a step in voltage, non-infinitesimal, over a step in time, non-infinitesimal. So that's a delta t. And in code, you'll often see it written as delta t or delta underscore t. Uh, and that's how we're going to calculate. So how does that work? Well, we need to go from time now to future time. So we represent future time. We have represented as t uh, exponent plus, And here, future voltage as v exponent plus. Not, it's not an exponent. I'm sorry. Uh, superscript plus, not an exponent. The point I was trying to make, not an exponent, this is not an exponent, it's just a tag, and it's a superscript tag. And what I've represented here is the simplest kind of in integration, which is called the implicit Euler numerical integration, invented by Dr. Euler in the 16th century, maybe. Um, please correct me. Um, if you were doing implicit Euler, you would, instead of having the V here, you would put a V plus here, and the algebra would be slightly more difficult. Uh, and that's uh, also in my textbook, we go through that. So um, we uh, now just simply have to rearrange terms. Again, what we do in computer science is often just algebra. When you do these real analyses of systems, when you do the calculus, that's more serious math. But a lot of what we end up doing is, is simply algebra, which is not that hard. Uh, well, uh, assuming you went, uh, you remember what you did in high school. We all went to high school, but not everybody remembers it uh, very well. So we have now V plus minus V. And uh, that again is delta T, which is T plus minus T actually. And again, this is the explicit because we're dependent on the current V. Um, and so we can now expand out and we can rearrange terms and we get this, which is a bit ugly, but certainly very manageable in, in a computer. Uh, everything tends to be very manageable in a computer. So if we choose very convenient parameters, and really we don't have to do this because we're going to run this in the computer anyway. So if, if anybody's interested, I say you just write this down as a little Python program and show how well the integration matches the charging curve, which is the correct analytic solution of this ODE. Um, so if we set, basically set things to one and we just do our algebra, we end up with a V uh, superscript plus next V of 
what turns out to be 0.999 uh, times V plus 0.001. And T, meanwhile, is stepping forward by the time step, which in this case is 0.001. Notice that this was an algebraic equation, algebraic expression rather, and here the equal sign really meant equals and what would be represented as two equal signs in a computer language. Um, and here we are doing an assignment. A single equal sign in your computer code means assignment, different from equality. And so we're taking T and updating it. This is an updating expression, an assignment expression to make T the new T and to make V the new V. And so again, you can run this in your computer. You can dump it uh, to a table in Python to a list of numbers or a NumPy array. And from there, you can graph it and show that as you go to a smaller and smaller time step, you'll get a better and better approximation. And one thing you can also see as you look here is it's basically those uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then gradually starts to deviate away. So initially, it's a highly linear curve, and that reflects the fact that the Taylor expansion of x of negative x is going to be um, a, a uh, going to have a uh, x term at first, a linear term initially, and so uh, you can neglect uh, higher terms when you're doing dealing with small times in this case, small changes. Um, so when we put this into our passive simulation, uh, we find that we can charge as we just showed. And then when we release the charge, when the input ends, the membrane will discharge back to reversal potential for leak. And so here we put in two inputs and uh, we find that they uh, just it will follow one another and then relax uh, back to leak. And we can play with the parameters. Uh, we can play with the capacitance. We can play with the leak uh, conductance uh, and get very different effects. So here we, for example, again, this is from my textbook, we have no summation. Here we have a lot of summation. You can play around, see why that would occur. Um, and we can look at here at uh, the relaxation at different points. Uh, in addition to doing positive charging, as I mentioned, we can also do negative charging and get these very different sorts of patterns with just passive properties. So once we string together our compartments, and we had this little discussion, I think, yesterday afternoon, what in neuron is called segments is most of the time called compartments. And when we're dealing with chemicals rather than electricity, we often call them nodes. Um, so we have here a stylized picture of a cell. In real life, we could get a real picture of a cell and we could import that picture into Neuron or other simulators by using the Neurolucida program. There used to be other programs, but I think Neurolucida is the only one remaining active uh, to trace the cell under a microscope and reveal its precise shape. Uh, then we change it into frusta and cylinders, so the soma becomes a cylinder. It does not become a sphere but electrically, it doesn't make any difference because electrically, it's entirely crystal potential. Um, this thing is acting up again. Uh, so, the soma is isopotential. It doesn't matter if you'd represent it as a sphere or a cylinder when you're doing electrical membrane properties. However, it does matter when we do the chemistry because then the shape makes a difference. So that is something that we change when we do reaction diffusion. Uh, these things are called frusta. Uh, they're basically truncated tapering cylinders uh, or conic sections, I think, of some kind. Uh, so we can divide like this. And then uh, when we have a branch point, we have to uh, uh, make new sections. 
So this is this notion we spoke of yesterday, sections and segments. So here, any unbranched length whoops, can be made into a section. And then, in this case, we segment the section into two segments, which is a bad idea. You always want to use an odd number, usually a multiple of three, because otherwise 0.5 is not going to exist. And that's annoying because we often measure things from the middle. Um, and so here we would do it more properly, three segments in this section. Now, some things that come from neurolucida, that come from neuromorpho, will actually be have sections that are represented as these uh, little pieces. But the proper way to do it is to do every unbranched dendrite is a section, and then the number of segments or compartments is determined by the number n seg, uh, which you can change so as to test spatial discretization. So then, again, these are levels of conceptual model. And you see at each level, we've made approximations, compromises. I mean, in some respects, this is an enormous compromise, deciding if the soma is going to be a cylinder. But in other respects, for electrical purposes, it doesn't matter. Because you are aware of the conceptual model, uh, when you get to reaction diffusion, you could immediately see, as we did, that it did matter. In fact, uh, Robert McDougall, you've met, spent a lot of time uh, and wrote a paper, a great paper, um, a very technical paper, worrying about how to convert a shape into a waterproof membrane that connects well to these other shapes, connecting these frusta in a way that made sense, uh, not in a way that's precise, not in a way that exactly represents the cell that was traced in neurolucida, because the tracings in neurolucida don't offer that degree of detail. Conceptual model to other conceptual model. The uh, now equivalence circuit, we see each piece here, each segment, each compartment, has the elements that we talked about before of a, of a GNA, a GK, maybe a GCA as well, um, and a resistor that's the leak as well as the capacitor. And now what we've added is that these are connected with resistors which represent the longitudinal resistance. So this whole blob is the resistance across the membrane and this resistor is the longitudinal resistance along the neurite, or in this case, dendrite. So here we have this idea of the passive membrane, membrane resistance in and out, axial resistance, R sub A, this way. Again, come back to the conceptual model. Is this realistic? It's probably pretty good. I often wonder, I often have wondered in, in my dreams, what happens as you really get this, uh, this, this part of the dendrite stuffed full of endoplasmic reticulum, which is all membranous and where the current cannot flow. Or in some cases, you'll actually see on EM a mitochondrion seeming to fill up a neurite, uh, sometimes an axon, uh, axon more often than dendrite. And it would seem like an enormous impediment to flow. And uh, we have not looked at that. Um, uh, Tom Bartol wrote M-cell, which could look at that. Um, I'm not sure that he has. I don't recall that he has. But uh, to me, to me, these questions are interesting. <laughs> they're, they're very uh, small grain questions, but I think they have consequences that reach pretty far. One thing that, that uh, a guy named Paul Rhodes did I thought was very interesting is working with Rodolfo Inas for his uh, thesis at NYU. He identified the implications at the network level of dropped action potentials. And he, in his simulations, he often identified dropped action potentials at axonal bifurcations, where, for example, a collateral comes off. Collaterals are very important. Uh, they go to nearby cells often, from a uh, axon is projecting very far. So uh, th this would be another reason you might have dropped action potentials if you've got a an axon that's stuffed with mitochondria. This perhaps would be uh, something that could happen in ALS. Someone's done a study of ALS looking at the change in mitochondria in the axon. ALS is a disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. 
So passive propagation, this can generally only be done in these very severe and uh, unusual circumstances, at least severe and unusual for a mammal. That's to say a squid axon. You can maintain it at 6.3 degrees centigrade. Uh, it's big. It's a giant axon. So you can stick electrodes in the axon um, and you can uh, then block the sodium channel with tetrodotoxin. You can block the uh, potassium delayed rectifier, the potassium channel with uh, 4AP, I think. Uh, and then you have a passive membrane that's a realist, real biological passive membrane, but poisoned. And tetrodotoxins is stuff that the uh, people tip their arrows with to get a deadly uh, arrow, or that they not, uh, supposedly change people into zombies by giving them tetrodotoxin. I don't know how well that works. Not the same zombies that you see in the, on TV. Different, different type of zombies. The Haitian, Haitian voodoo zombies. Um, and um, we can now do this experiment in real life and also, again, do the equivalent circuit in simulation and show that we can get very good correspondence in terms of voltage passage, so the passage of a wave of voltage passively down a giant axon. And then one can work out endless variations on this theme. And uh, this is something which I again, have a little trouble with because, again, it's, it's very non-biological. There are probably no passive membranes in biology. But on the other hand, we do do this kind of a blocking trick to examine dendrites or axons uh, so we can get experimental data that corresponds to this. So yesterday I gave the parable of the six blind people and the elephant. Today, the parable of the single drunkard and the good Samaritan. The single drunkard is seen poking around on the ground and the good Samaritan comes and says, did you lose something? And the drunkard uh, says, yes, I, I lost my keys. And the Samaritan said, oh, you, you lost them here, right? I'll help you look. He said, oh no, I, I lost them way over there. But I, I'm looking here because this is where the light is. So the, here is where the light is. We can identify things about these membranes. Uh, we can measure them. We can measure them pretty precisely. Um, so we identify uh, this <clears throat> cell and find out that there is, in fact, an exponential fall off in uh, with distance, and this is now a cylinder, so a large diameter axon, a dendrite would be tapering, so it would be a little different. Uh, and also a large, an axon for practical purposes for this kind of a measurement is very long. So you can approximate it by an infinitely long axon, which is another approximation. So we get this kind of equation, which looks familiar. Here we see a drop off instead of the rise with the charging curve. We have a drop off of negative x. So before we were looking at negative t. So we were looking at change in time. Here we're looking at change in distance. And so we start at a v naught at the center, and then we get to a steady state where we have a drop off with distance. According to remember, we had a time constant tau. This is a space constant lambda. So lambda turns out, and you can do the simulations, and you can work this out analytically, to be R membrane over R axial. And again, I tend to think this kind of analysis is quite limited and limiting, but there is a whole fat book devoted to this. And that's uh, the book, um, I actually forget the title, but it's by Jack Noble and Sien, and it's uh, not in print anymore. Uh, but it goes endlessly through various iterations and just can show a few, I think, coming up. So uh, here we have the notion of PDEs. So we talked about ODE, ordinary differential equation. This has to do with PDE, partial differential equation. And the reason we think of it in these terms is that there is a derivative with respect to time. So you have the charging curve, which we discussed. And there's also the derivative with respect to space. So when you take the derivative with respect to time, you're only taking a part of the derivative, partial derivative. 
because you're not incorporating space. When you take the derivative in terms of space, you're only doing part of the derivative because you're not considering time. And uh, so here we could measure something if we had nice two-dimensional graphics in time and space and see how that, that works. A nice way to do that in neuron, in fact, is the range of our plots. You can show a, let's say, an action potential in the center of the cell and the way it spreads out and a wave, depending on whether the axons are, act uh, dendrites are active or not, towards the, to, towards the outside. Um, I'm going to turn off Slack because I am sick of hearing about your cat. Um, or else I'll just start talking about my dogs. Uh, um, uh, one dog, actually. Bill, so, there, is, <clears throat> Bill, there is a question in the chat. Um, so okay, you okay. if you can put the question, I could turn Slack back on if you could put the question in that. But okay, please tell me what the question is. Okay, Sonia asked it in the chat, does that mean that a section, just one segment, has an equivalent circuit equal to a section with, let's say, 10 segments, but with a RA equal to one? Hope the question is clear. <laughs> uh, so, well, you'd have to talk about the units, but generally, if, if here, here's what the extremes. The extremes are, RA could be zero. So you have no conductance between segments. That means that you each of those is purely the, the, the uh, single parallel conductance equation, the single parallel conductance model, and they would each charge the same way, but separately. They don't communicate. The other extreme would not be one, which you'd have to talk about units, but that'd be like one ohm centimeters would be the, the usual units. Instead, the other extreme would be some enormous number, and we, we can't represent infinity, so we often write one E9, which is one times 10 to the ninth power. So whatever the units are, probably that's gonna be big enough. You can go higher, you can go one, one E20. Uh, anyway, the point is now the conductance is a, approximately, um, infinite, the resistance is approximately zero, and then yes, I think this is now the question, finally getting to the question you asked, yes, that whole set of segments in a section all works together and you can do an equivalent circuit with just a single parallel conductance equation. And in fact, if you read up in Jack Noble and Sien, there's this whole discussion of what's called the two thirds power law, which discusses when you have branches that have the appropriate ratio involving two thirds, but there's an exponent there somewhere, um, then you can reduce that entire branch structure to a single equivalent compartment, a single equivalent segment. So uh, I hope that answers the question, but please feel, feel free to ask more questions. Uh, okay, so we could just go on and on, and I don't want to. <laughs> I find this somewhat discouraging. And why do I find it discouraging? Because we've been doing this for 35 years. Well, I've been doing this for well, not, yeah, 30 for me. Uh, for Michael Hines, maybe 40, 40 plus. Uh, and it just feels like, you know, let's move on. This is just a, such an unrealistic situation. So anyway, I actually even this is the I got a, a bunch of these slides, most of these slides from Salvador initially, and he had even another slide that was more detailed. But we have all these definitions of different aspects of passivity, and uh, and then we have all these results with respect to passivity. And you and I are not passive, and our neurons are not passive. It's just not realistic. Okay. So active. Nope, still in pass. Oh my God, I left that in, did I? Well, here it gets worse. There it is. I mean, just get an eyeful, enjoy it. And I will move on. Now, active, right? Yes, active. Oof. So we have this equivalent circuit that we built. And actually the way I showed it in the first place was with active elements, which we haven't really discussed yet. And so in addition to this passive, piece. Uh, actually, the way I drew it is 
okay, this is the way I drew it. So we'll go with what I drew it is here we have three segments. And this one is entirely passive. Well, this is not unreasonable. Okay, so maybe maybe you have hot spots. It's been postulated. It's never been clearly shown that there are hot spots, particularly for calcium channels, but there's certainly there's some suggestion. Uh, so there may be parts that are practically passive, parts of a dendrite. Then there are parts of a dendrite that are highly active, a hot spot. So here I wrote a calcium. Uh, reversal potential, as well as a potassium, as well as a synaptic. And here, entirely passive except for the synaptic. Again, these probably would all be present in a single segment, but is, for, for discussion, didactic purposes, this is fine. Now, these rheostats, as we said earlier, are going to be voltage sensitive. The synaptic rheostat, here it says E sin, if I can't read it, uh, is going to be activated by a neurotransmitter. So we have to come up with rules as to how that activation works. And there's a nice paper by um, Alanda Stex with Zach Main and Terry Sinyowski just talking about uh, how they can I, put together a synaptic model that makes sense in terms of Hodgkin-Huxley type modeling and kind of draws the two together. And that's actually a model that was also used by uh, John Rinsel a lot for many years. Uh, but he never published it in an explicit way. So we have this passive propagation pattern. So here, this first EPSP, I generated uh, here. And so it gets here down in the basilar dendrite. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Here, I generated another EPSP where this circle is. I should fill in these circles, more visible, uh, in the soma. That's smaller going to the basilar dendrites. These are basilar dendrites. This is called the apical dendrites. They're often apical obliques that would come off of here. We don't seem to have any here. I would say this is just a bifurcation of the apical dendrite and not an apical oblique. And then we will have a tuft up here. Uh, this is presumably a thin tufted cell, or thin tufted and thick tufted layer five cells. Um, here at this bifurcation, we generate an EPSP here. Again, it decrements going towards the soma and towards the, uh, the, the basal dendrite, and it decrements also in the other direction. It should decrement more in this direction. I think I can see that than it does in this direction. And the reason is, that here we have a termination, and here we don't have a termination. And so a termination means voltage uh, current effectively piles up here at the end of these spines. So you have this, this asymmetry. And here, I, I think you can see some of the asymmetry. This EPSB and this EPSB are the biggest we're going to see because they are right at the end of a dendrite. And at the end of a dendrite, all the current can only fall in one direction. Whereas in the middle of the dendrite, current can flow in both directions. So you have uh, impedance chain, uh, enormous impedance difference in the two directions. If we now make it active, go from passive here to active here, a single EPSP put into the soma, the active effect uh, is, is very dramatic. And you get this kind of uh, dramatic change, particularly where you have a bifurcation which is represented by the arrow here. Um, but you get propagation, back propagation, BP, back propagation of the AP, action potential, back propagating action potential up the apical dendrite. Now, finally, piece de resistance, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, the excitement is building. Uh, we've been through this figure, we've been through this conceptual model, we've been through this algebra, I'll just do it briefly again. If we inject current on the inside, I in here, it has to flow somewhere. That's Kirchhoff's law. There's conservation of current. It's not going to disappear, except when it gets outside and disappears into the ground. So INA will be GNA times V minus VNA, et cetera, for GK and GL. And again, the law of capacitance tells you that IC is C EV dt. So I n will equal the sum of the four branches. Sodium rheostat branch, potassium rheostat branch, 
leak resistor branch and the capacitor branch. And then rearranging terms, which I screwed up somehow, there should be a minus sign here, there's a minus sign here, we get the equation, which now is not something that we can solve analytically, but is something that we're going to be able to solve on the computer. So what is the action potential? What's going on? Okay, it is a positive feedback system initially. Massive positive feedback leading to this enormous upswing due to influx of sodium. So a change from the resting membrane potential, which is based on the sum of inactive channels, primarily the leak, uh, let's say it's negative 65, to near to, but never reaching the sodium reversal potential, which is something like positive 55, and never reaching because the leak is still there. So we're never going to get just sodium. The leak is not even changing at all. And in fact, as the positive feedback occurs, and as we climb the slope to our peak voltage, the potassium channel, which turns on more slowly than the sodium channel starts to turn on and that starts to add in a negative feedback element and at the same time the sodium channel is turning off um, and because the sodium channel is off and the k is on you get actually an overshoot and after hyperpolarization so going up is depolarization going down is hyperpolarization this is the polarity of the cell, resting membrane potential. Um, and that's an overshoot that then, as potassium goes off, will gradually go back to resting membrane potential. So positive and negative feedback are the shape, determine the shape of the action potential. Increasing voltage reaches a threshold, sodium channels open, positive feedback, increased voltage, increased voltage, Continuing increased voltage, sodium channels close, potassium channels open, decreased voltage, overshoot after hyperpolarization. This is the main figure of the entire talk. So, uh, additionally, as with everything in biology, as with all models of biology, this is wrong. There's evidence that this model, which is brilliant, was put together by Hodgkin Oxy in the 1940s, I think. It was published in the early 50s. Um, in the way the sodium channel behaves is not exactly like this. We also, of course, now know there are many isomers, isoforms of sodium channels. They behave somewhat differently. Uh, the complexity is enormous. So actually, we were doing a study where we're studying NAV 1.7, NAV 1.8, NAV 1.9. These are the sodium channels that produce action potentials in the peripheral nervous system, particularly the uh, C fibers are the peripheral nervous system, which are responsible for pain. So this is of particular interest for pain research, pain treatment, trying to get away from opioids, trying to get away from narcotics, uh, doing new and different things to treat pain that would not be addictive. And so we're interested in the, the precise dynamics of these particular sodium channels, which are quite different, uh, well, which are quite different from the way Hodgkin Huxley described them, and yet we still use the Hodgkin Huxley parameterization because we don't really have a much better one. We could use Markov models, but they're not that great either. Okay, just another picture of the same thing because again, this is what I really want you to remember. Resting potential, only leak is open. Number one, only leak is open. Rising phase, sodium starts to open. Here, we're really, just putting enough in a, enough voltage to get to the threshold. I can tell that because we've almost plateaued here when suddenly we have the positive feedback uh, take over because the sodium channels now cause increased voltage and the increased voltage causes opening of sodium channels, which causes increased voltage and that is the nature of positive feedback system across a runaway positive feedback system will cause an explosion and that's not good so we avoid an explosion because sodium channels start to close and potassium channels open and then we have here what's regarded as an overshoot i don't really know why they call it an overshoot because again it doesn't reach sodium 
uh, reversal potential, and then we have an undershoot at the end, and then we get back eventually to resting number potential. Um, I don't know what happened to that slot, but let's go to this slide. Okay, so the conductances themselves are functions of voltage and time. So that's what made them a rheostat. Um, and uh, let's skip that. Oops, now it's jumping ahead. Okay, let's skip that. All right, so now we can really talk about the Hodgkin Huxley equation. So back to the same slide, sorry. GNA is a function of voltage and time. GK is a function of voltage and time. GL is not. C is not. Uh, the potassium channel, some description of a potassium channel. Uh, potassium conductance will increase uh, over time if you give it a step voltage. So this would be voltage clamp, as opposed to what I've been showing before, which would be current clamp. The idea of clamp means you decide what the voltage is going to be for voltage clamp, you decide what the current is going to be for a current clamp. Uh, there's a slow rise and a faster decay. Um, it can be described as a power of four. It's not an exponential, it's a e to the negative four t. And so we describe it in terms of difference equation as the n particle to the fourth power, identifying four gating variables or four uh, states that need to go individually, gradually from zero to one. So this idea of four states in a channel, again, here we have uh, a conceptual model that these are represented as gates. Not at all clear that that's valid. Uh, they mm -hmm. open with depolarization. One opens, another opens, another opens. And once they all open randomly, because m these individual ion channels operate uh, with a Markov kinetics, it's historyless. Uh, once they all open, you can conduct potassium. Uh, another way of viewing it is that this may have something to do with there being four different subunits but that again the, seems like a slide. somewhat questionable question we can't see the slides uh the screen just uh, i don't know the you page. cannot see the slides <laughs> yeah the presentation no. just oh. ended yeah so wait i'm not presenting anymore no correct yeah. we're not seeing your presentation i'm going to stop presenting and start presenting again i think you dropped out of the okay, call now we only have your phone connection and not the video. Yeah, I did it as a separate connection because it's so problematic. Now I, it says I am presenting. Stop presenting. You're not in the call, Bill. You're only your phone number is. Yeah, I mean, I, so you can hear me, right? We can hear you, but the yeah. user itself is not in the call with the slides. It, uh, you mean I, I'm kicked out? I think so. Okay, because I show myself still presenting. Okay, I got to kill the browser, I guess. <sighs> okay, browser's dead. Computer I see is overheating, sorry. Um, I have not found a good browser for doing this. Let's try Chrome this time. I tried Chrome yesterday without much success. And now I have to find the address. All right, I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'll leave the camera off because that's probably a bandwidth hog, right? Sounds good. Okay, now I have to find the presentation again, of course. Um, And 
for that. All right, Salvador, you just want to present it? Do you have it there? No? Um, okay. I've, I'm almost there. I'm getting very close. Very close. Very close. I'm sure I'll get there. Uh, you are presenting your screen. Yes. Now we see it. All right. Now we see this. And now I have to find my place where I was. So slow. Now, Chrome and, and Brave, I always find much slower than Firefox. But Firefox is the one that just crashed. In case anyone's wondering. Let me go just to here. Then present. And then we have these bunch of empty slides somehow. Yeah, it's just slow. Well, okay. So I think I was about here. We can to another. We talked about potassium. Yeah, as so I say, I did order another computer, but no sign of it. That's working for the state. Computers or any other object, physical object, are inaccessible. I mean, I should have done this one. Yeah, that wouldn't work either. Yeah, it might have worked faster. I had done this on our uh, work computers remotely. And so I'm not using the sound anyway. So here's the potassium description. Alpha is the opening of the channel. Beta is the closing of the channel. One can work out all this algebra. I think there's an appendix in my book. And uh, then you get this idea of a tau n, a time constant, which is voltage dependent, and an infinity, a final target that is voltage dependent. And so that's going to be the case for all, for both the potassium and the sodium channels. Again, it gets pretty hairy, but you can see that now what we had as GK, which is the conductance of potassium, is expanded out as G bar K, which is a parameter just a number times n to the fourth, which is now what's called a state variable in this set of linked ordinary differential equations. And so the only change here is this, and now we're going to see that we're also going to change g n a to g bar n a times m to the third times h. Um, so we have the same kind of situation for the uh, sodium channel, but now it's going to be GNA equals M to the third times H times G bar NA, where G bar NA again is a parameter, just a number. And actually, I thought I took all of these slides out. I'm sorry. I don't know how they crept back in. But we can describe it in the same way, the same ersatz way, because this is not, it's not realistic. Uh, at some point, maybe someone will do. And maybe well, no, so no one has. Someone will do a proper molecular dynamics study of these channels. Again, you'd have to choose a particular channel from a mammal, from a squid. Very different, obviously. But he's even within the mammal. NAV 1.1, NAV 1.2, NAV 1.3. A lot of different channels that you can choose from. And if you're really going to want to explore one, you have to explore a very specific one. You can't just take the whole population of channels. So we have the same kind of rule. But now, in addition to having a uh, w the activation, we also have inactivation. So here we have activations. Uh, these are called the infinity curves. M infinity is the activation for sodium. H infinity is the inactivation. You can tell activation because it goes up as you go to higher voltages. You can tell inactivation because it goes down as you go to higher voltages. In the case of the potassium channel, Again, ideally, many kinds of potassium channels, they behave differently, uh, and all of them probably so show some inactivation, but for, for an approximation, and in the, during the course of the action potential, they show no inactivation, so we represent it as simply showing an activation, and that's represented by N. So these are the three state variables, 
of the Hodgkin Hertz equation, m, h, and n, and the fourth is, of course, voltage. Now, at the same time, the, the, these are also described by time constants. So the time constant of h is relatively slow, whereas time constant of m is extremely fast, which means activation will happen much faster than inactivation. And that's what allows you to get this enormous positive feedback before the sodium channel turns off. Uh, the tau for the potassium n particle is somewhat slower. So a four-dimensional dynamical system, which you could describe very readily if you had four-dimensional space, but we're always working with just two dimensions. We have the action potential, and what we see happening during the action potential is that M goes up enormously during this positive feedback phase, N goes up less enormously. These are all capped at one. All the infinities go from zero to one, so all of the particles go from zero to one. That's just a convenience. Zero open to 100% open. N actually never reaches one. H actually shows inactivation, and so its particle goes down as voltage increases. And so what that is, is the channel is starting in a fully de-inactivated state and then inactivates. Um, and you can see here in this slightly more elaborate graph that the infinity goes up even faster than the M goes up. The M solid line follows the dotted line with a slight lag that represents this very fast tau m. Much more obvious looking at the h, the h has a substantial lag as it follows the h infinity. So that's the differential equation. So ODEs mean that the m and h are following these with rates that are relatively slow in the case of h, relatively fast in the case of m. Okay, so that we already said. Uh, this is a, just for entertainment. It's, it's impressive that these guys did this in the 40s and 50s because there were no computers as we currently understand them. And the reason they stopped calculating, I mean, you can really almost not tell which one's the uh, real one. The real action potential is here from a squid and the simulator is here. The way you can tell is that they stop. And why do they stop? Because it was very laborious to do these calculations. These were done by calculators, computers actually they called them, who were people on calculating machines, adding machines basically, doing step-by-step -step laboriously with their hands. And uh, there's a movie, Hidden Figures, where they talked about doing that for the space uh, program. This is the same thing they did here for action potentials for the squid giant axon. <clears throat> well, here are the equations. I showed them at the beginning of yesterday's talk and said, yeah, it's overwhelming. Uh, but again, if you play with it, you get to know it, you, you, you can learn to love it eventually. <clears throat> we use this hodgkin Huxley parameterization everywhere. And again, it's an approximation. <clears throat> it's not even terribly accurate for sodium and potassium in the Squid, it's less accurate in a mammal. We're using the same parameterization, meaning the same forms of equations, but we're using very different parameters, meaning the exact numbers we put in it. Again, the mammal is much faster than a squid. We operate at a higher temperature than a squid, so we expect to be faster. This is a set of channels depicted from a thalamic cell, which I modeled. And um, I particularly like the way I, I, I did this. Actually, I, I, I owe a, a, a gratitude to uh, Pat Church, who suggested in part that we do it this way. So here's the sodium channel activation. And what it shows here is that it shows the associated time constant. So it shows it's very fast. It's a time constant on this logarithmic scale in seconds uh, that's in, on order of microseconds. And this shows that it activates between approximately negative 50 millivolts and let's say negative 20, 10 or 20 millivolts. And this shows by the arrow that this is an activation curve. 
Meanwhile, the inactivation curve for the fast sodium overlapped here somewhat, points in the other direction because that's inactivation. And that one is much slower up higher here. Uh, a very interesting channel, in fact, the one I studied mostly in this paper was the T channel of calcium, which is very unusual because at resting membrane potential, it's already entirely inactivated. So to de-inactivate it, you have to take it to a, a low voltage. And then if you release from that low voltage, you get it to activate. So it's this complexity of here with, I think, nine channels. We may have 10 or 20 channels in a single compartment. We may have many compartments. So this terminology is a little bit confusing. Activation then deactivation, inactivation, then de-inactivation. Voltage up, voltage down. In the case of the sodium channel, M up, M back down, H down, H back up. So we have a number of consequences, which are very cool, and which is part of why Hodgkin and Huxley got the Nobel Prize. It's not just they describe this, this explained a lot of things that were mysteries about action potentials and about neural potentials. There's a threshold. It's called all or none. I said the other day, maybe it's not quite all or none, but it's mostly all or none. So you have a threshold where you have a bifurcation. Uh, I, I believe that's fair to say, analytically speaking. You have something called anode break. So here in the dashed line, you give uh, no prior hyperpolarization, you give an EPSP and you get no action potential. Here you give this hyperpolarization, what does that do? That de-inactivates this, uh, this sodium channel. It also has effects on the, on the potassium channel, but let's just wor worry about this. So it moves the H infinity towards one which is a de-inactivation. And then when you come to the EPSP, because you are de-inactivated, you can get a spike. Uh, you get this nice current frequency relationship, which has been used a lot in arguing for the notion of spike rate coding. Uh, you go to higher and higher nanoamp currents in the model, and you get faster and faster frequency in hertz in terms of spiking frequency. Eventually, you get to a point where you get depolarization blockade, and you end up with what's in the model is practically a sinusoid, um, as the sodium channel basically is inactivated and just uh, goes back and forth slightly between degree of inactivation uh, at, at, in depolarization blockade. And so this is where they have this comparison to artificial neural network units, which are represented as a single scalar, where they say you have this sigmoid curve of activation matched by here a uh, simulated cell showing current input, hertz output, frequency output. Just very briefly, and I think I'm also out of time, yes, uh, an additional parameter which causes and a lot of trouble <laughs> is the Q10. A Q10 is, again, a lot of this stuff is not realistic. Some of this stuff is more unrealistic than others. Uh, the Q10 for ion channels is pretty unrealistic and uh, it, it nonetheless is used. You should be aware that ion channels, like all other enzymes, will go faster at higher temperatures. So there's a big difference certainly between 37 degrees mammalian temperature and 6.3 degrees deep sea squid temperature. Um, but this rule, which comes from the Boltzmann equation, is not necessarily, is probably not in most cases at all followed. So the Q10 is a parameter, it's represented by a number, usually it's a three, maybe a five. Uh, Q10 for just diffusion is maybe a 1.5. And that parameter is exponentiated to the change in temperature divided by 10, hence the 10, Q10. Um, and so often we have a simulation that we're running, let's say, at 37 degrees. So I say temperature of the simulation is 37. 
and the temperature of the experiment is 22. We can use Celsius because the size of change in Celsius degrees is the same. It's the same degree size as Kelvin. Uh, so we don't have to, it doesn't matter because we're taking a subtraction anyway. And so if we have a Q10 of three, that being the parameter, the speed up, the change in tau for all your channels would be hypothetically about five, 5.2. Um, again, people who adapt this too slavishly, it, it's just not going to work. And there is a, a, a guy whose name I forget at the Blue Brain Project who's really trying to investigate this by doing all his voltage clamp at two different temperatures and seeing, he really needs to do three or four different temperatures, but for now two, and seeing if, if these rules uh, are, are reasonable at all. And, and generally they're not. The thing you have to know is speed it up, not how much you have to speed it up by. Realistically speaking, we end up making sure that our simulations work and not being too slavish, certainly about uh, Q10. Another thing, and I owe this slide to uh, Sur Suranjana, Suranjana Gupta, who is in this class, um, and is uh, the GHK equation. So we learned the Goldman equation earlier. This is the Goldman Hodgkin Katz equation. And this is very important for evaluating the effect of the calcium channel because we normally do for sodium channel, potassium channel, other channels, a linear equation where the alteration of the current, current here on the x-axis with, sorry, y-axis with voltage here on the x-axis where it's purely linear. And in fact, the gradient of calcium is so dramatic, and this is very well described in the Hiller book, even in the first edition, if you want to grab that off the web, the gradient is so enormous that effectively you can never pass any current from the low side, the inside of the cell, to the high side, the outside of the cell. So instead of a linear equation where you would just continue up and up and up and up and up and up and up, when it comes to reversal, there is no reversal. You just plateau out. And so that's what the golden Hotz equation, Hotz and Katz equation, which is down here, which we don't want to go into in great detail right now, gives you. And uh, Sir Anjana did these nice uh, variations. We vary temperature. It's temperature dependent. It really doesn't make much difference. Um, but if we vary internal calcium, when you go to a very extreme internal calcium, then we can get reversal. And so then we start to get something very much like the line that we expect from the classical linear description of G times V minus ECA. Uh, here, varying external calcium. Uh, at some point, you get to a point where you don't have any gradient. That's what's shown here. Now the current is generally zero, near, near to zero, no matter what your voltage is. Now this just describes this component, the linear component. We also have the dynamics again of the GCA, which we would typically describe as having activation and inactivation, as I briefly described for that T channel, inactivation uh, through uh, de-inactivation through hyperpolarization followed by activation uh, of an anode break type of phenomenon where you could get the calcium spike after you uh, uh, have hyperpolarized. And that's what gives some of this bursting activity, which you see in spiking wave epilepsy in the thalamus, as well as in deep sleep. And I think that's the last slide. So I will take questions. Okay. I'll turn my Slack back on. Well, hopefully I've not been speaking into the void. Is anyone there? Yes. Yes, we're here. Oh, that's good. Okay, so no questions. Good. I'm glad you're there. <laughs> that's, that was the main thing I was concerned about. No, 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 thanks. Thanks. So we meet again. When do we start again, Salvador? Uh, so we start again 11.30. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. All right, no problem. Bye. Bye.